Well, thank you all so much for being here. We're gonna go ahead and get started. We will have, um, as you may have seen in the chat, we'll have uh, students joining us kind of trickling in um, over the next 10 to 15 minutes or so as they're transitioning from one class to this virtual webinar. Uh, education, of course, in the time of COVID right now where so much is virtual requires a lot of moving parts and juggling various uh, digital platforms. So I'm really excited and grateful that uh, you all have joined us today. Um, well, we're going to go ahead and get started with our um, really exciting program that we have planned for you called Backyard Conservation, Protecting Georgia's Native Wildlife. Um, my name is Karina Newsom, and I work with Georgia Audubon and I'm the Community Engagement Manager. Um, and so uh, Georgia Audubon is an organization that centers around protecting birds throughout Georgia and creating places where birds and people thrive through research, through conservation, through community outreach. And so we're very excited to be partnering with the Amphibian Foundation um, on today's program. And I'll go ahead and pass it over to Crystal. Good morning, everyone. My name is Crystal Mandika, and I'm the Director of Education for the Amphibian Foundation. Uh, amphibians are actually disappearing from around the world due to disease and habitat loss, and the Amphibian Foundation is a nonprofit corporation that's committed to developing lasting changes to the global amphibian extinction crisis. Thanks. Hey everyone, uh, I am Henry Adams. I am the Assistant Director of Education here at the Amphibian Foundation. Just joined the team this past September. Um, it is a real treat, honor, and privilege to be working with Crystal, Kiana, and Karina um, on this project and many other amazing projects as we try to bring amazing critters and um, education about them to the greater Atlanta area and beyond. So very excited to be here today. And then, hello everyone. My name is Kiana Leverett. I am the Education Program Coordinator for Georgia Audubon. I'm so excited to be partnering with the Amphibian Foundation because I feel like the more work that we do together, the more work that we can do out in the world and get it out to more people. So, really excited for this. Now that we've introduced ourselves, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so we're going to start talking about the great state of Georgia. Georgia is a very special state with a lot of very special habitats, um, even when you're thinking about the continent of North America. So we are going to start um, by working our way through Georgia's ecosystems, moving from North Georgia down through Middle Georgia and then to South Georgia, talking about the habitats that you can find, the ecosystems you can find, and the wildlife species that you can find there. So we'll go ahead and get started right away with Kiana taking us to North Georgia. <clears throat> awesome. So I want to start off by saying that North Georgia is majority the is majority mountains really, Every, people call them the North Georgia mountains. And it's a mixed conifer habitat that means trees that essentially are evergreen all year round and a diverse riparian understory, which means lots of other smaller trees that fill up the brush. And the trees and the mountains are a direct result of millions of years of erosion, which is rain running down the mountains and weathering the rocks and the landscapes up there because of this erosion is so diverse and ranges from rivers to valleys to mountain bogs, which are very unique for North Georgia, as well as gorges. So the biggest difference between the upper mountains and the lower mountains is that the upper mountains or the tops of the mountains are more of a conifer habitat, meaning there are more evergreen trees up there. There's more weathering, so more steep peaks and harsh valleys, rock faces, as well as a diverse flower population because it's a very unique climate. And so most of the animals and plants that you'll find up there are very cold tolerant and they can tolerate the changes in precipitation. And the lower mountains have more fertile soil because it's a little bit warmer down there. And so there's also room for more riparian and hardwood trees to grow, which are trees that can lose their leaves during the fall and the winter time. And some of the threats or the biggest threats to North Georgia wildlife are the, are the diseases that you find on trees. The corner in the picture in the upper corner is hemlock woolly adelgid, which is another disease that really affects the trees, specifically hemlock trees in North Georgia. 
the destruction of essential habitats by different things like wildfire, as well as animals that come in and run over like feral hogs. <laughs> I'm getting my wearing too many things with a mask. <laughs> um, all righty, so now we're gonna transition um, into more middle Georgia. Middle Georgia is a really fantastic area of our state because we have what is called a fall line. This is a dramatic change in elevation. Um, the fall line, as you can see in the map here, covers roughly 20 miles, um, roughly 20 miles in, in width. And it is, a, I think, about a change um, roughly 600 feet above sea level. Um, so that's a pretty dramatic shift in elevation over a rather sh um, small area. And the fall line is actually the ancient Atlantic Ocean shoreline. When the uh, dinosaurs were still uh, around roughly 65 million years ago, that is where the Atlantic Ocean used to be. And so the Atlantic mm -hmm. Ocean, all that sand um, from the ocean has been deposited in the fall line and then into the coastal plain, which Karina will talk a little bit more about later on. Um, at the fall line, there are lots of waterfalls, and also this is an um, enormous, really cool transition between habitats. Um, when you see a transition between two different habitats, when you go from the forests of the Piedmont to some of the um, grasslands and flatwoods in the fall line and coastal plain, that transition is called an ecotone. Um, and in the fall line area, uh, as I was mentioning, uh, there are the longleaf pine flatwood uh, ecosystems, which I want to talk to you a little bit more about. Longleaf pine flatwoods, as you may uh, have guessed, are dominated by the longleaf pine, um, Pinus palustris. Um, these are really incredible ecosystems. They have mostly quite moist soils that don't drain very well. They maintain a lot of moisture throughout the year. They often have small wetland pockets in these habitats. Um, there is also a large amount of biodiversity. This, um, this term refers to the number of different species that live in the area. And so you can see there are tons of beautiful grasses, other herbaceous or close to the ground um, vegetation. And one of my favorite things about these flatwood systems is that they have carnivorous plants, like the pitcher plants that you see here. The soils are not typically very nutrient rich. So a lot of the plants there have had to adapt to finding other ways of deriving their nutrients, such as predating upon arthropods, insects, and other um, invertebrates. The longleaf pine flatwood system, unfortunately, um, is a very endangered system. Roughly, I believe, 3% of this system is around today. As you can see by this map here, the historic range of the longleaf pine flatwoods was relatively large, covering roughly 90 million acres. Um, and this, the declines as a direct cause of European colonialism and now North America, um, mostly due to commercialized timber harvest as well as continued urbanization. The flatwood wildlife, as I was saying earlier, is enormously biodiverse, lots of amazing plants, pitcher plants, orchids. Um, some of the most iconic species in these systems are the red cockaded woodpecker, the gopher tortoise, as well as the frosted flatwood salamander, which is a personal favorite of the Amphibian Foundation. The red cockaded woodpecker is a really fantastic bird um, that is a conservation focus for many ornithologists in the southeast. They live in these really unique family groups. A lot of birds don't do this, where offspring from the previous year will actually stick around with the parents and help raise the offspring of that year. Um, this is primarily a behavior that is seen in young um, in juvenile male red cockaded woodpeckers, with the females actually dispersing to other breeding habitats. They are what is known as an ecosystem engineer or a keystone species. An ecosystem engineer is an animal that basically creates habitat environments for other animals. And so what red cockaded woodpeckers do, they are primary cavity creators, meaning that they make cavity nests in um, living pine trees that other animals then, then can use. And so that contribution to their ecosystem makes them what is known as an, a keystone species, something, a species that basically just contributes so, so much to their environment as a whole. And if they are taken out of that environment, then the entire system is at risk of collapsing. And unfortunately, these were once very widespread with extremely large numbers num numbering in the millions. 
Um, they are now down into the thousands, but there's a lot of really excellent conservation efforts that have been done over the past several years to rebuild those populations, like creating artificial cavity nests and, of course, reestablishing the longleaf pine ecosystem as a whole. And then for an amphibian, uh, this is again the frosted flatwood salamander. This is an animal that we at the Amphibian Foundation work with quite a lot. Um, this is a species of mole salamander. The mole salamanders belong to the family Ambistomatidae. Um, they are very appropriately named because they love to burrow. Um, most of the time, unless it's during the breeding season, these guys can be found underground, um, oftentimes in old crawfish burrows. But then during the breeding season, which happens during um, the winter, so anywhere between middle December to late January, these and other mole salamanders will emerge from those burrows and move to seasonal or ephemeral wetlands. These are impermanent wetlands that will only fill up during certain times of the year. And these are really excellent and important habitats for the frosted flatwood salamander as well as a number of other amphibians because they can't sustain fish. That is a really key aquatic predator. And so removing that predator allows um, these amphibians to safely breed in these impermanent wetlands. The frosted flatwood salamander, much like the red cockaded woodpecker is a, is a, a species of conservation concern. And so we at the Amphibian Foundation are doing a lot of work um, with reintroducing um, these animals, doing captive breeding uh, programs and reintroducing them to the uh, flatwood system. And so with that, I think that we are going to hand it over to Karina for the Coastal Plain. Yes, so the Coastal Plain is one of my favorite parts of Georgia because I've done a lot of research in this area. And the Coastal Plain is essentially um, the rest of Georgia from the fall line that Henry described all the way to the current Atlantic. You can't hear me? Oop. Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> you can hear me? Okay, great. Strange things happening on Zoom. Um, anyway, so the, uh, the coastal plain is the section of Georgia. It takes up actually most of the area of Georgia. And it's the habitats that are found um, from the fall line that Henry just described all the way down to the coast of the Atlantic Ocean in Georgia. A lot of people don't realize that Georgia has a coast, but we very much do. Um, and so uh, this coastal plain, which again takes up a huge swath of land in this state, was formed from sediment. So if you remember erosion, um, Kiana describing what erosion is, water carrying little ground up bits of rock. Um, erosion happened over millions of years, putting all of these deposits, all of these ground up pieces of rock into the ocean until it eventually built up over time, creating this very flat coastal plain in Georgia. Um, now the coastal plain, has a variety of different ecosystems, but some of its most notable and coolest ecosystems are the wetlands. We have very large wetlands here in Georgia. Uh, we've got freshwater wetlands, such as the Okefenokee Swamp, which is actually the biggest swamp in North America. It's about 438,000 acres, and to kind of give you an idea of how big that is, a football field is about one and a half acres. So that's like 300,000 football fields. That's how large the Okefenokee Swamp is. Um, but in addition to freshwater, uh, wetlands. We also have um, saltwater wetlands and we also uh, we have a very similar amount of saltwater wetlands as well and these are typically in the form of salt marshes and we have about 400,000 acres of salt marsh on the coast of Georgia um, and Georgia's coast is about a hundred miles long. Now um, the salt marsh is a very special place because our salt marshes are tidal which means that the water level rises and falls twice a day every single day, um, about 12 hours apart. And so this constant movement of water makes it a really dynamic ecosystem and animals have to have very special adaptations to survive there. Um, and just to let folks know, if you have a question, you can put your questions in the Q&A. Um, and once we get to the end of this portion of the talk, we will answer any questions you might have before moving on. Um, in Georgia, so back to that tidal wetland, um, we have some of the highest, biggest tides along the Southeast coast of the United States. Um, the difference between low tide and high tide can be six to eight feet sometimes. And we've got a variety of birds and insects and mammals that live in these tidal environments, um, hundreds and hundreds of species. And so some of the most notable species, we'll start with uh, a reptile, is the diamond-backed 
Terrapin. Now I wanna make sure you all can see this picture all the way um, on the right hand side here. We've got on the right hand side, a baby diamondback Terrapin that is hiding kind of in the mud in the marsh and then an adult more full size Terrapin. Um, this is actually a threatened species of aquatic turtle um, because their, ha their, their populations have been kind of going down because of human activities such as habitat loss. You know, the, um, the, the marsh that they require to live in is becoming smaller and smaller. Um, and they need that marsh grass to provide cover for young turtles and to find food. So this picture that you're seeing on the right um, is a small diamondback terrapin that I found during my research in the salt marshes of Georgia, because that's kind of the ecosystem uh, that I study. But they love to look for uh, invertebrates, animals with no backbones, uh, such as snails and crabs, like the spittler crab. Now thinking about birds, one very special bird species to me is the seaside sparrow, and that's the species that I've studied extensively. Um, and this bird builds their nests in the marsh grass and made of marsh grass, and they eat lots and lots of insects. Um, now they have a really interesting situation. Um, they have to build their nest at the perfect height off the ground. If they build it too low, they risk getting flooded when that high tide comes in. But if they build it too high, they risk being seen by predators. So they have to really fine tune where they place their nests. Um, so now we're going to move on to talking about some of the threats to birds in the state of Georgia. And Kiana is going to um, fill us in on some of that information. You are muted. I think you're muted still, Kiana. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So there are a couple major threats to birds in Georgia. And one of the biggest ones. I would say the biggest one is habitat loss and fragmentation. So habitat loss is, of course, when you're losing a habitat and habitat fragmentation is sort of like turning a larger habitat into smaller and smaller sectioned habitats to where there's not, there are larger gaps between habitats for animals that need that large habitat. And so because of habitat loss and fragmentation, nestering and wintering grounds can disappear. But another big issue with habitat loss is also invasive species and invasive plants that are coming in and taking over these natural habitats that are necessary for certain animals that are native to the state of Georgia. And so when they're covered, when their nesting grounds and their wintering grounds are covered by non-native fauna, that it's an area that they're not used to. And so they tend to go and nest in other places like you see where you have a bird on top of a street light. Mm -hmm as well as them reaching out into urban spaces and replacing, to, in order to replace their valuable habitat. If you ever see birds in your chimneys or in your house or trying to get into places that you normally wouldn't expect them to be, that's not necessarily a tree or on the ground, it might be because of their habitat is missing. And when there's less habitat, all these birds that need that necessary habitat are all competing for the same resources, which can majorly affect their population sizes. And some more specific and urban threats that might occur in bigger cities or suburbs would be unchecked predator populations. The top picture, I would say a large predator is a cat. And the cat is a major predator because a lot of people don't think, oh, when I let my cat out of the back door and just let it do its thing in the backyard, you don't really know what it's doing. But in all actuality, unchecked cat populations kill over a million birds every single day. And if they go unchecked, they can end up changing, they can adapt to the landscape, which is great for them, but they change the landscape and as well as the ecosystem that birds and other native species are used to because they're not used to competing with this animal that is not normal or not a place in their habitat. Another big issue is light pollution and window collisions. In urban spaces, I'm sure we all have those days where it's nighttime and we just leave all the lights in our house on, or you're driving through the city and you see lit up skyscrapers and lit up buildings, not realizing that birds can't necessarily see the glass. So they can collide with the glass thinking that they're flying straight. And also light pollution can also affect how they navigate. So birds that are migrating won't necessarily be able to make it to the destinations. They'll be confused by all the light that's occurring at night. And then some of the threats. Oh. All righty, and some of the threats to herpetofauna are, are pretty much re um, repeated from what Kiana was just telling us about the threats 
to avifauna. Um, habitat loss and fragmentation is a really big issue. We've been talking a lot about habitat loss as it relates to the um, longleaf pine flatwood systems. Um, habitat fragmentation, the breaking up of habitat um, by construction of roadways or other um, human establishments can be really disruptive to salamander movement. They move from uh, woodland habitats to their wetland breeding habitats and frequently have to cross roadways, which obviously doesn't um, bode well for them a lot of the time. Environmental pollutants like pesticides and sediment pollution can be really detrimental to amphibian populations. And then of course, as Crystal was mentioning earlier, infectious disease. Chytrid fungus is what is called an emergent infectious disease, meaning that it is a disease causing agent that is just cropping up onto the scene now. Um, it was introduced um, into much of the world from East Asia, its native range, and has decimated frog populations in particular, as well as salamander populations worldwide, endangering over 500 different species of amphibians. Now, given the variety of threats that both birds and reptiles and amphibians are facing, Conservation organizations like Georgia Audubon and like the Amphibian Foundation are doing work existing solely for the purpose of making sure that these birds survive in a changing world. So Georgia Audubon is doing quite a bit of work to help protect birds in response to the challenges that Kiana was describing. We're trying to do things like making the city safer, especially in urban landscapes like the city of Atlanta. Because windows are such a big threat, they can't see them, they didn't build them, they don't know they're there. They're designed to not be seen, right? Um, we are doing things to make windows more visible to birds through projects like Safe Flight, where we put um, stickers and, and images on windows that allow birds to see, hey, there's actually a barrier here and avoid flying into it. And we're actually gonna meet a survivor of a window collision today in just a few minutes. Um, and then addressing kind of what, it, uh, um, Kiana was talking about regarding um, migration, birds, particularly songbirds, will migrate at night. During the rest of the year, they're awake during the daytime and they sleep at night, but during migration, they're migrating at nighttime and those lights are very confusing. And so we gather as many people, individuals, businesses, big buildings, small houses, to get people to turn their lights off during migration to help birds who are moving through the city uh, to be able to do so without being confused by the light. So you all at home during migration, which is in spring, uh, mainly March through uh, May, and then in the fall, primarily September to October, try to turn your lights off at night as often as you can. And then we're also trying to address the lack of habitat that oftentimes happens in cities because people build things, right? Um, so we are trying to make habitat for birds in places where people might not expect. So we get people at home to help put up bird boxes and plant plants that birds really enjoy eating from and living on. Um, and that way we can create spaces that birds are able to survive in even in the middle of a city. And like Karina was saying, very similar again to the amazing work that is being done by Georgia Audubon and other folks to conserve avifauna um, here at the Amphibian Foundation and other um, conservation organizations, universities. There's a lot of things that can be done to protect herpetofauna as well. Um, primarily the engagement of uh, captive breeding populations, making, uh, you know, designing captive breeding programs for the reintroduction of endangered species like the striped newt that you see pictured up here at the top is one of our species that we work with a lot um, here at the Amphibian Foundation. Um, of course, habitat restoration, we were talking a lot about that regarding the uh, longleaf pine flatwood system in just terms of trying to conserve what little is left as well as letting it grow back into more of its historic status, um, developing uh, more artificial um, yeah, habitat areas that are going to um, boost the chances of these um, of these animals in, in surviving. Um, of course, uh, regarding um, emergent infectious diseases, disease surveillance is incredibly crucial to understanding um, how wildlife populations are being impacted by diseases. I am a wildlife disease ecologist and we'll talk a little bit more about that during the career section, but surveillance is one of our greatest tools to getting ahead of these would-be disasters, these would-be uh, conservation disasters. 
And of course, constant research, understanding the ecology of, the, of, the ecology of these animals so that we know how to best live with them. As you can see here, I've, I've been able to study some salamanders down in Costa Rica. This is one of my animal, one of my study animals off to the right here. And so, um, you know, conducting surveillance, understanding their ecology, um, knowing what diseases they do have and how they're interacting with them. All of that is a part of the larger conservation puzzle. All right, thank you so much. Um, so we are now going to uh, address questions. There were a couple of questions in the chat. So um, someone asked, um, what causes the salt marsh to be tidal? Um, that's a great question. The reason why salt marshes are tidal is because they are right on the edge of the ocean. And the ocean naturally has a water level that rises and falls depending on where you are at different times. It's actually connected to the moon, believe it or not. So there's a lot of science that goes into that. But the reason why those wetlands are tidal compared to the freshwater wetlands that are further up into the state of Georgia is because they are right next to the ocean. Great question. Um, and then someone asked, how many different species of birds do we have in Georgia? And it looks like Kiana uh, put a, a number in here for you. We've got hundreds and hundreds of, of different species that you can find here in the state of Georgia, somewhere between four, um, four and 500 uh, bird species. Um, great question. All righty, so now we are going to move on to a very exciting portion of uh, the program. And we're going to be meeting um, some awesome species of reptiles and amphibians, as well as, uh, a, as I mentioned before, a survivor of a window strike, a native bird to right here in Georgia. So we'll go ahead and all of us will um, mute our videos and audios and allow um, Crystal and Henry to tell us all about the species um, of, of animals that they're gonna be introducing us to today. All right, we'll make sure the crystal is unmuted. Hey right. everyone. Perfect. All right, let me. All right. Hey everyone, is any uh, thumbs up if y'all can hear me okay? Looking, we're looking good. Okay, super. Hey everyone, I'm Henry. This is Crystal. Again, we are with the Amphibian Foundation, and this is Phil. Phil is a savanna monitor. Um, one of our number of savannah monitors that we hear that we have here at the foundation. Um, Phil is native to sub-Saharan Africa, so as that would imply, uh, this species is native to the region just below the Sahara. Um, native from all the way from the uh, the west coast to the east coast, from Senegal um, over to Sudan. Um, living in a really cool, dry, scrubby environment known as the Sahel. Um, or savanna, these Sahel, these uh, scrubby and um, and uh, dry grassland environments. The savanna monitor is a really cool um, species of monitor in that they have a pretty um, uh, specific diet. If I can get Kiana to zoom in a little bit on the head here, you can see that Phil's head is very blunt. It's very stout, it's very powerful, and this is a very well designed for crushing invertebrates. So the Savannah Monitor actually has a pretty narrow diet um, limited specifically to snails, um, millipedes, and other gastropods, other invertebrates, other things that have really hard shells that Phil needs to crush. Um, and so the really powerful jaw structure that you can see here is really crucial for that. Um, Outside of that, Phil can grow to be relatively large. Savannah monitors, I believe, can grow to be upwards of about three feet long. So Phil is pretty young. And um, Crystal, how old is Phil? Phil is about two years old. Okay, so pretty slow growing. Yeah. yeah. Do you know when do they when do they reach their um, their their full adult um, size? I would say maybe about five years. Okay. Alrighty. Yeah. Very cool. So yeah. he's just a little guy right now, but he's going to get to be at least maybe five. Okay, five, five feet. Yeah, so I was a bit under in my estimation there. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So these are pretty large animals. The monitor lizards, the group of monitors um, known as the varanids, they belong to the family Varanidae, um, is the largest. These are some of the largest lizards in the world. The Varanids actually um, include the largest lizard being the Komodo dragon, the large cousin of Phil, which live on the island of Komodo in, um, in Southeast Asia. 
So I think that in the interest of time, we're going to say goodbye to Phil. He's also a bit of a grumpy boy. So <laughs> we actually had another Savannah monitor out for you guys earlier. One of our larger ones, his name's Parth, and he was throwing a bit of a temper tantrum earlier. Um, so we are now going to meet an amphibian. If I can get a good hold of him. So this beautiful, beautiful round creature is a Pac-Man frog, also known as an Argentine horned frog. These guys are really fantastic animals. They are sit and wait predators. Um, they uh, basically will sit on the forest floor in leaf litter, um, concealing themselves. Some of them have a lot more coloration on the back. This one is a particularly green one, but a lot of them will have much more brown modeling so that they can conceal themselves well while they wait for something to pass by. As you can see, most of this um, guy's body is made up of its mouth. These are basically just one giant lump of a mouth waiting for something to pass by for them to eat. They are extremely voracious and what are what is known as an opportunistic predator, meaning that they aren't super picky about their diet. Um, they will eat anything from insects and other invertebrates to small mammals, lizards, and even other frogs. They can be cannibalistic. Um, these guys are native to South America, ranging in Argentina, Uruguay, and Brazil. And they are super popular in the international pet trade. A lot of folks are quite clever with genetics um, when it comes to breeding these animals as well as other amphibians. And so they've been able to breed them into a lot of different uh, colorations, um, which make them quite popular. And of course, I mean, who doesn't love that face? A couple of other really cool things. Oftentimes you will see this kind of horn structure that you see above the eyes. This is a really cool feature because oftentimes predators <laughs> of amphibians are looking for certain things. Eyes are a really good way of detecting prey. And so these horns are a way for a predator that's swooping in from above, like a bird or something else that is attacking from an aerial perspective. This is a really great way to divert the attention away from the frog's eyes. And so this basically contributes to its overall camouflage. Um, you might be wondering why I am using gloves to handle this Pac-Man frog. Um, this Pac-Man frog is, as we said earlier, an amphibian, um, which is basically, a, the amphibians are a really amazing group of animals um, that are typically characterized by their very moist and absorbent skin. Uh, they really are quite dependent on their skin for absorbing water, oxygen, and it's very sensitive to chemicals that can be on your hands, such as the oils that your body naturally produces. If you happen to have some pesticide on that because you just sprayed from mosquitoes and you went out into the, um, you know, went on a hike. Um, it's really important that if you're going to uh, handle an amphibian that you wash your hands or use gloves. It's best to just use gloves, especially if you are like me, a wildlife disease ecologist, using gloves between each animal prevents this transmission of diseases from one individual to another. So on that note, I am going to change my gloves before we meet the next animal. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> well, you can keep yours on if you just want to, yeah. So Crystal actually, <laughs> Crystal is already gloved up, which is perfect. Uh, pass those that way. Um, Crystal is already gloved up and we are going to meet, oh, one of my absolute favorite animals I think I've ever had the joy of meeting. This is Louie. Louie is a tiger salamander, a close relative of the frosted flatwood salamanders that we were discussing earlier. The so Louie is another example of a mole salamander. The scientific name for this is Ambistoma tigrinum. Very appropriate, basically the tiger mole salamander, which is exactly what Louis is. This is one of the largest salamanders that we have in um, the eastern United States. They can grow to be um, roughly 8 uh, to 13 inches long. Um, very, very robust uh, creatures. As you can see, Louis is uh, quite, quite a beautiful, chunky creature um, with those beautiful bug eyes. I mean, it's just truly a, like, how can you, how can you not love that face? Um, tiger salamanders, as I was talking a little bit about earlier with just mole salamanders in general, have a really fantastic life history. Not only do they undergo the amazing process of metamorphosis, like a lot of amphibians do, but they also have a relatively migratory life uh, cycle throughout the year, which is something that you might not really associate with amphibians. 
But as we were talking about regarding the movement of amphibians uh, during the breeding season, um, these guys really love hardwood um, forest systems. So that is, as we were discussing a little bit earlier, I think Kiana was getting into those terms when we were talking about the North Georgia forest. Um, those are systems that are dominated by um, deciduous trees, trees that will lose their leaves during the fall and the winter. And so this is the primary habitat for these guys during the non-breeding season. And then during the breeding season, again, in about middle December into late January, they will leave those woodland habitats, um, often not going too, too far, um, to find their wetland breeding sites. And at those sites, the males will deposit what are called spermatophores. They are packets of sperm that then the females will uptake using their cloaca. And that will fertilize their eggs, which then they lay in these really fun gelatinous egg masses, which then will take a certain amount of time to develop um, and hatch into the larval phase of these animals. Tiger salamanders are super duper cool in that, especially with tiger salamanders in the western portion of the United States they can be super sensitive to changes in their weather. So in certain years, you might have a particularly dry year, not a whole lot of rainfall. Um, and that means that there's not gonna be as much aquatic vegetation and resources for tiger salamander larvae to utilize. And so in those times of drought, when they need extra amounts of nutrients, certain individuals within a clutch of salamander eggs uh, within a clutch of salamander larvae will actually metamorphose into a unique larval stage that is cannibalistic. They will develop extra large jaws and they will actually predate upon their siblings and that will gain them the nutrients that they need to fully uh, metamorphose into adults, even though there is the, uh, the drought going on. And so I think with that, we're gonna meet our last animal here. This is one of our favorites. This is Charlotte the beautiful eastern indigo snake. Charlotte is a native to the southeastern um, portion of Georgia, the coastal plain that Karina was talking about earlier. It's a really amazing um, species, one of the largest, if not the largest um, species of snake here in North America. They can grow easily to be up, upwards of eight feet long. Just a really fantastic creature. They are pretty well known for uh, really enjoying uh, the burrows of gopher tortoises in the coastal plain area. Um, gopher tortoises, like we were talking about, red cockaded woodpeckers are also ecosystem engineers and keystone species. Um, and their presence is something that Charlotte and other indigo snakes benefit off of greatly. Um, these are really amazing animals in that they can, they have also very, very powerful jaws, very much like Phil the Savannah Monitor. And so they specialize in essentially just crushing their prey with brute force. Um, but as you can see here, and this has been my experience with handling other Eastern, Eastern indigo snakes, they are one of the best handleable and most gentle snakes to interact with. In fact, she's trying to say hi to Kiana. Um, but yeah, I think that she's just an absolutely stunning animal. And so I think that um, that is the, I mean, in the interest of time, I think that we're going to um, say bye to Charlotte. If you guys have any questions about any of the animals that you've seen during this program, feel free to drop us a question in the Q&A and we'd be happy to answer it later on. But I think that we're going to need to move on for now. Thank you, Charlotte. Katie actually asked how many different types of salamanders live in Georgia, and I believe uh, between 60 and 70 different salamander species. Does that sound, um, does that sound right? Uh, between 60 and 70? I think that that is about right. Yeah, we're having a bit of trouble getting Charlotte back <laughs> into the box, which is not super. Um, there we go. Come on, awesome. Charlotte. Thank you. And Brian <laughs> asked if that was a black mamba. I can see why you think that, but this is actually a uh, a non-venomous species. Black mambas are venomous. This is a non-venomous species that is native to right here in Georgia. Um, so don't have to worry about any venom coming from this beautiful snake. But um, uh, Kiana, if you want to go ahead and mute. And Melanie, we are going to meet our final animal um, of the animal encounter period right before we get into our um, career talk. So we'll go ahead and move on to Melanie, who's going to introduce us to our bird species, um, who we're going to meet today. Again, as I mentioned, he is a window strike survivor. Um, so we're going to be, we're very excited um, to be able to 
uh, meet this very special bird. Um, so Melanie, feel free to go ahead and sh share your video. Um, You've disabled my video. Oh, let's see here. There we go. Okay. You should be able to, there we go. Okay. Hi, Melanie. <laughs> Hi, and I'm, good morning, everyone. I'm Melanie Furr. I'm the Director of Education at Georgia Audubon. And Sibley and I are at home today enjoying some sunshine. I'm going to turn this around so you can meet him. So this is Sibley. He is Georgia Audubon's Education Ambassador. Goes out to schools and community programs and hospitals to teach people about birds and ways that we can conserve them. Uh, as others, Kiana and Karina, were mentioning earlier, Sibley is the victim of a window collision. He, he broke a wing and he does not fly anymore. He can shuffle along his perch and, and flutter himself forward to move around, but he doesn't fly anymore. Unfortunately, up to 2 billion birds are killed every year in window collisions in North America, and Sibley is you know, one of those victims, uh, he, he didn't die, fortunately. He now can teach others about the dangers of windows, but with his broken wing, he doesn't fly anymore. Uh, he can feed himself. I'll start, turn this a little bit so you can see. Oh, he's gonna change positions. He's got a variety of different perches um, so that his feet don't cramp because he spends a lot more time on his feet than normal hummingbirds do. Um, but you can see his little nectar feeder there. He gets a special nectar uh, to try to closely replicate what he would get in the wild. Hummingbirds, as you probably know, drink nectar from flowers, but they are also aerial insectivores, meaning that they, they catch small insects while they're flying around. So Sibley here has a special nectar to make sure that he's getting protein and vitamins um, to keep him healthy. In Georgia, we only see hummingbirds in the wild in the spring through the fall. So they are mostly gone from Georgia now. They generally are uh, migrating in August and September. They're passing through in, in big numbers in those months, heading down to their tropical homes uh, in Mexico and Central America, where they can find the flowers and the insects that they need to sustain them through the winter. And then they'll be coming back to Georgia uh, to nest throughout the state, arriving in late March. So you can um, be on the lookout for them again next spring. Put up a nectar feeder is a great way to help these birds plant native flowering plants and trees is another way to help hummingbirds. Um, but we feel very fortunate to have Sibley to inspire and educate people. He, uh, as far as we know, is the world's only hummingbird ambassador. So I'd be happy to answer some questions before Sibley and I sign off. Um, if anyone has questions about Sibley, you can feel free to put them in the Q&A. And even if you have questions that come to you after Sibley uh, leaves us uh, for the program, you can feel free to su submit them then and we can answer them before the end. Um, but it is a very special, very, very special experience to be able to see a hummingbird this close because in the wild, they move very quickly, right? They're very small and it can be hard to get a good look at them. Um, but thankfully, Sibley um, survived the incident, as Melanie said, um, and so he's able to provide people a nice up-close look at just how beautiful they are. I mean, look at that throat. Um, Brian asked the question, is uh, the baby honey hummingbird going to be okay? And also, how many hummingbirds do you rescue? Melanie, if you uh, would like to answer that. Sure. So Sibley actually has been with me, living with me, for uh, over two years. He was injured when he was just a fledgling hummingbird, and he just had a few ruby speckles on his throat. And I should have mentioned that at the beginning, uh, ruby-throated hummingbirds, only the males have that namesake ruby throat. The females have a white throat to help camouflage them when they are nesting and feeding young. So Sibley is a male um, and his color that we see is actually only a trick of the light. As you saw when he turned his throat up, Throat feathers are sort of a dark slaty gray, almost black. 
and it's just the way the light hits and scatters um, that we sometimes see those ruby colors. So Sibley, unfortunately, uh, will spend the rest of his days as an education ambassador. Um, but as you can see, he's pretty, pretty happy, pretty content, loves his sunshine, loves his bath. Later on, we're gonna get in the car and go for a ride. Uh, he's got a booster seat so he can see out. Um, you yeah, asked about the number of hummingbirds that are injured. I do some wildlife rehabilitation as a volunteer effort. And this summer, just myself, uh, I helped rescue and rehabilitate probably 15 hummingbirds that were injured. And I, you know, I'm just one person in DeKalb County. So if you can, you know, imagine that across the state, across the Eastern, um, you know, United States and Canada, there, you know, the window problem is, is a serious one for hummingbirds and many other species. Awesome. Well, thank you so very much, Melanie. There are a few more questions about hummingbirds that we will actually answer um, after we move on to our career section, just so we can make sure we get that information in for everyone. Um, and so, Melanie, these are questions that I think we're good to answer. Um, so thank you so much for joining us again. Being able to see Sibley up close like this is such a, a wonderful experience. And of course, we are sad that Sibley suffered these, these, these injuries, but we're glad that we are able to at least share his story and the uh, incredible um, information that he has to offer simply by existing and showing us what he looks like and what he does and how he lives. Um, so we're very grateful that you were able to bring him on. So thank you so much, Melanie. Um, and so for the final, about 10 or so minutes, um, we are going to about, you know, well, about five to 10 minutes, we're going to talk a little bit about um, careers in wildlife sciences. Um, because many of us, all of us here, have had different career paths to get to where we are. We do different things um, in the field of wildlife conservation. Um, and so we wanna share with you what that looks like. And we're gonna have a little bit of um, a panel discussion and we will start um, with Kiana. So Kiana, if you wouldn't mind um, sharing with us what it is that you do and the key um, essentially experiences that you had along the way to get to you to where you are right now. Okay. okay, so, so, so. <laughs> I am an environmental education program coordinator and, and that's a really big umbrella term basically saying that I like teaching people about the environment and why they should be out there in the first place. And some of the key experiences that I have had, well, first off, I would say just going outside and realizing that I actually do enjoy being out there. But also I would say just having different experiences. I've had the pleasure of being able to do field research. I've had the pleasure of being able to go through internships and travel to different places to see different kinds of environments to sort of understand how all of it works together for us to be able to one, take care of it, but also be in it. And I think what keeps pushing me is my passion for getting other people into the outdoors, especially if you don't have a background, if you don't call yourself an outdoorsy person, I want you to go outdoors. And so that is what inspires me to keep pushing and trying things that I've never tried before. I used to think that I couldn't hike for a long time. I used to think that I didn't like snakes. I used to think that I wasn't cut out for being in this space, but the more you, the more you expose yourself to different opportunities and different internships, going to different places, just going out to explore, you'll realize that you aren't as far off of it as you realize. When I was in college, I did a lot of research programs that are available at all different universities. There are nonprofits that put on research programs and scholarship opportunities for people to be able to work alongside professionals and understand what they do. And so I used that and did a lot of different ones to sort of see where I fit into all of it. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kiana, for sharing. Um, I'm going to move over to uh, Crystal. Crystal, I think your uh, video is muted, but um, if you wouldn't mind jumping in, explaining um, what it is that you do at the Amphibian Foundation and then some of the key experiences that you had to get you to where you are today in your career. Hi, everybody. Can you guys hear me okay? 
Awesome. Well, I am the director of education for the Amphibian Foundation, and that means that I create classes for students ages 3 to 18 about amphibians and reptiles. Uh, with my education team, I work to help kids understand how amazing amphibians and reptiles are and uh, why they are important to our environment and our planet. Uh, we've created classes like Critter Camp, Snakes of the World, Baby Turtles, magical amphibians and reptiles, and our Pokemon and their real-life reptile and amphibian inspirations. So we've got lots of classes to choose from. Um, and I'm actually the happiest when I'm able to put a frog or a snake in the hands of a child for the first time. Uh, seeing the joy on their faces, um, it makes it all worth it for me. Um, when a child realizes how amazing one of these animals is, I know that they will actually teach those around them about the importance of conserving these species. And that's why I do what I do. Um, I guess 13 years ago, I, you know, I realized that I loved amphibians and reptiles, and that completely changed the course of my life. Um, I started off um, trying to be a lawyer, but it turns out that my love of law isn't what made me happiest. And it's actually uh, working with kids and animals that truly makes me happy. Thanks. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Crystal. Um, and I'll go ahead and jump in and kind of describe what I do and how I got here. So I, um, as I said, am the community engagement manager, but my training and background is in biology. And I'm also a field biologist. I'm actually in graduate school right now studying the seaside sparrow, which is the bird that I described a little earlier on when I was talking about the coastal plain and salt marshes. And I actually got my, my experience to get into this career um, when I entered high school, my senior year of high school. I always loved animals, but I didn't really know what to do with it. I didn't know what kinds of careers existed. And then I ended up looking for internships at the Philadelphia Zoo, my local zoo. I was able to intern in animal care and education. And getting that hands-on experience through internships at my local zoo is what introduced me to the wide variety of careers in wildlife conservation. Um, so I went to school for zoo and wildlife biology, got, uh, uh, had a lot of opportunities to volunteer in animal care both at my school and at my local zoo, um, which is always really important to be able to get as much hands-on exposure and experience as you can. Um, so then when I graduated, I actually worked as a zookeeper for about four years. And so I worked with a variety of mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and birds. Birds, of course, are my favorite uh, uh, kind of group of animals. Um, and so I was able to kind of get a lot of experience in the animal care side of wildlife conservation. And then I recently transitioned into the research side of conservation, which is what I'm doing in graduate school, which means I got my bachelor's degree already and now I'm working on my master's degree. Um, and so essentially I have a mentor um, who helps me do research and I go out in that salt marsh that I was showing you pictures of early on, looking for seaside sparrow nests, studying their behavior, studying the predators that look for them. Um, and my life right now is consumed uh, by that research and of course the community engagement element of sharing my love of birds with the people around me. Um, so we'll go ahead and move over to Henry. Henry, if you wouldn't describe uh, what it is that you do or and have done um, in the field of wildlife conservation and the key experiences that kind of set you on track. Yeah, of course. You hear me okay? Okay, fabulous. Um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I am um, first and foremost a wildlife disease ecologist. Um, I just finished my graduate school experience um, this past July, so I just graduated with my master's in wildlife ecology um, from the University of Georgia, um, where I was studying uh, emergent infectious diseases of amphibians, um, specifically salamanders in Costa Rica, um, which was a pretty amazing. Um, Crystal's fixing my camera for me. Thanks, Crystal. <laughs> um, so I um, I have always, I, very similar to Karina, very similar to all of us, you know, I, I've entertained this enormous love for, for wildlife literally my whole life. You know, there are pictures of me when I was two years old um, with my dad holding my hand so I wouldn't fall in the, in the creek um, behind our house, you know, just me like, you know, looking under rocks and stuff, like getting all muddy and um, so like been, you know, been at it since day one and, um, and uh, just exploring the different animals that are out there and trying to learn as much as I can about them has always been, you know, at the forefront of what drives me in life. And um, 
I also come from a very artistic family. Um, I'm a musician. My mom and dad are both musicians and artists. My dad is a graphic designer and illustrator. And so I learned how to draw from him. And so I'm also a nature and scientific illustrator. Um, and so art has been a really fantastic way for me to not only connect better to the animals that I care so much about, you know, being able to, um, it's, it, for me, it's one thing to be able to look at an animal and, you know, commune with it. And that's um, incredible. And then it, it, for me, taking it to the next level of, of um, getting to take its photograph and illustrate it. Um, and then using that illustration as a means of communicating scientific and conservation um, ideas and goals and issues to the general public as a means, you know, for outreach and education. That is really the full circle for me. Um, and so I uh, was able to actually a couple, I have a couple of really formative experience, actually Crystal and Mark um, here at the foundation have been um, enormous players in um, my trajectory. So in 2013, I came to Crystal and Mark wanting to be an intern um, with the Amphibian Foundation. And so I came on as a husbandry and illustration intern. And I got to work with one very special frog that I'd like to show you all here on my phone. This is Tuffy. Um, you all might know of Tuffy. This is a rat. He is a Rab's fringeland tree frog. And at the time, he was the last individual of his species. Unfortunately, we lost Tuffy um, in 2016, was it, Crystal? Yeah. Um, and so that species is now extinct. And I had the distinct um, honor and pleasure of working with that particular animal, taking his photograph and illustrating um, that animal along with a number of other endangered frog species. And so that experience really dedicated me to um, the conservation of amphibians and delving into that kind of research. And then working with my graduate school mentor, Dr. Sonia Hernandez, um, who I've known since I was 18 years old. I was able to study abroad with her down in Costa Rica and she really taught me um, pretty much, you know, everything that I know about how to engage with the natural environment, how to ask really, um, you know, engaging and thoughtful questions that are going to, um, you know, provide some answers that are going to allow us to really make some positive change. Um, and so that was the overall goal with my um, graduate school experience. And as I said earlier, I can't, you know, express how grateful I am to be working with this amazing team with Kiana, with Karina, with Crystal, with Mark, and everybody here at Georgia Audubon and Amphibian Foundation at promoting um, that positive change in the world. Awesome. Thank you so much, Henry, for that information and for the, that background on your story. Um, and one of the most important things that we can offer to students is understanding what advice would we, people who work in wildlife conservation in a variety of capacities, give to young people who are interested in working with wildlife? What advice do we have for them? And so I'll go ahead and start. Um, because I didn't really know about the careers that existed for people who liked animals, all I knew about was veterinary medicine, right? I wanted to be a veterinarian because that's what people who like animals do. Um, but as soon as I learned about internships at the zoo, I was introduced to a whole new suite of careers. So. If you are particularly high school students, um, high school and middle school students actually, um, there are oftentimes lots of programs at your local zoo. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about conservation careers, I would look up the zoo that's closest to you and the youth programs that they offer because it'll get you a nice look behind the scenes into the work of wildlife conservation. And not everyone that works at a zoo is a zookeeper. There are lots of different things you can do uh, to contribute to conservation. So look up your local zoo and see what programs are offered um, through internships and volunteer program experiences. I would also encourage you to look up the local green spaces and parks that you have near your home. A lot of times there will be educational programs that take place at those parks to introduce you to the native wildlife where you live. Um, and show you again show you the different careers that might exist for people who like wildlife and of course i always encourage people go outside and look closely at the world around you and the wildlife around you because you'll find especially if you live in an urban environment that there is way more life than you realize um, outside um, and so i will go ahead um, uh, and turn it over to Henry to see if he has uh, any advice that he would give as we wrap up right now um, to young people who are interested in wildlife careers. And uh, Melanie put into the chat that Zoo Atlanta does have a program for teens. So if you are in the, Anna, uh, in the, zoo, in the Atlanta area, excuse me, um, that is a great opportunity for you to get some experience. Yeah, absolutely. I can't emphasize enough all of the information, all of the um, uh, advice that Karina just offered. Yeah, getting out into understanding what you're in, what's what's out there for you. Um, you know, folks, 
uh, often think that you have to be in uh, in these like pristine environments to be a wildlife ecologist. And while that may be true for certain animals, depending on what you want to study, um, the field of urban ecology is something that is just so um, it's really at the forefront right now because obviously as human settlements begin and you know, continue to expand into these natural areas, we're trying to figure out the balances between, you know, living comfortably in our environments, living equitably, living, you know, developing good human habitats while also coexisting with wildlife. And so urban, you know, urban wildlife is a really, really great way. You know, if you're in the Atlanta area, if you live in the Midtown area, um, you can find slimy salamanders right in Piedmont Park, um, you know, right in Metro Atlanta area. You can find these animals and you can commune with them. You can understand them. You can study them. You can just enjoy them. You don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to study them to have a great love for them. And yes, as, as Melanie was saying, um, uh, it's uh, the volunteer program is amazing. And my buddy Ty went through it. So I think that with that, I think that we need to begin to wrap up. But uh, yes. yeah. Um, thank you all so very much for joining us. We, of course, have so many incredible things to share. We are running short on time. Um, so if there are questions that you had that we were not able to answer yet, the teachers, I would encourage you to email me and I will share those answers with you. But thank you all so much for coming. And we look forward to interfacing and interacting with you again uh, in the future. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Share any questions you have with us about careers or wildlife via email and we will get right back to you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.